to our April edition here in Mates, Creative Morning. Um, I hope you had a nice breakfast, met some nice people, uh, had some good conversations to be continued afterwards. Um, for those of you who are new here, I'll give a brief introduction on what Creative Mornings is, and then I'll hand over to the speaker, and yeah, then it gets, gets real. So, Creative Mornings essentially started 10 years ago by a lady called Tina Roth Eisenberg in New York. And her vision, so to say, was to actually achieve this. People get together, have breakfast, have a nice speaker telling them about an interesting topic. Um, today it happens in 183 cities. Um, every single one of these cities sticks to one topic. This month's topic or theme is called game. And yeah, so, so to say, it's an international movement. Um, but this can only be done, obviously, by some helpers. Helpers like mates, um, who provide us with a location. So thanks to mates, thanks to Eva, thanks to Lisa, and thanks to Stefan. Sorry, I didn't find a picture where you're also in it. Um, and also thanks to Veriwal, who provided the breakfast for us. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, but also thanks to the guys on the camera, Spinning Wheel Productions, who yeah, videotape everything and kind of yeah, make it available for everyone afterwards. And Futurus was also sponsored for this event. So in total there's 10 of us. We have you know, a team that kind of fulfills different roles. Everyone kind of yeah, pulls, so to say, their share. Um, from a graphic design, social media, to video guys, to organizational roles, organizing speakers. So, yeah, different roles. Um, if you think that you can somehow contribute to this, or if you know someone who can contribute to this, we hung up these speak up boards, and there's posters next to it. So, if you like to, if it's maybe you or your friend, you can just leave probably better your contact there because I don't know, it's not so nice to just put someone's name and phone number on there. <laughs> so yeah, we for every event we have hashtags to hang around. I think you've seen them by now. Um, so if you're a digital freak, just use them. And yeah, so this month's topic is game. And I'm not going to say much about this because we have an expert on this. And his name is Rudolf. So yeah, enjoy the next half an hour for some minutes with Rudolf. So, thank you very much and good morning. Yes, okay. So, uh, just to make sure, who would describe themselves as a regular gamer in here? Don't be shy. Okay, so let's do the, um, so let's do the famous, the famous uh, sing-along test if you're a real gamer. Okay, sound or so. Totally gamer. It's all right. Um, by the way, who has seen already uh, Ready Player One? Anyone? All right. I promise you, I came up with a headline before Ready Player One uh, inserted the famous shining scene. So, uh, just to make sure. All right, I try to um, put games as a term in the center of my life for this presentation, and I came up with um, this um, four-ish scheme. And, well, let's see, 1986, first time, first love. Actually, that was my first, the first time I ever played a video game, and it was Airwolf on the C64, back in the days, back in the days. Mm. Um, over here, 2002, now, is this really science? Um, I had the privilege of um, staying abroad for one year in Denmark with the famous Erasmus program. And 
um, what we now call game studies. Uh, you could coin the term back to 2001, where um, some Finnish and uh, Danish guys at the IT University of Copenhagen tried to establish a new field of study called game studies. And I didn't know that at the time. I was a vivid player and I always thought maybe there's some way of, of working with video games in a more scientific sense. And I really was astonished when I found out in Denmark they're actually doing this. Uh, so is this really science? Yes, yes, and it was really great. So um, I started my um, PhD thesis in 2005 back in Munich. And it had to do with the aspect of community building in online role-playing games. It was a great time. I finished it in 2009 and it was actually it was so great I started a second one in 2015. Great, great, great. Uh, in 2007 I also started freelancing, meaning um, writing texts about games for publications such as Süddeutsche or Jetzt.de. Um, unfortunately, in <laughs> Uh, yeah, unfortunately, 2009, the serious side of life. I started my traineeship uh, in a games PR uh, agency, and that's basically the way I, yeah, I, I, I'm still on right now. So why did I mention the word unfortunately? Because there's, a, there's some kind of problem when you're trying to be on the game PR side, on the same side, trying to be a freelancing journalist working for games. I think you can see the conflict of interest there. And there are many publications. It, unfortunately, but on the other hand, it's good that they do this. They gave, some, they gave themselves some sort of code of conduct. No, actually, we can't use, use texts from you anymore because you're working in the games PR right now. It's a problem, but on the other hand, well, it's a good thing because everything in between the gray and shady areas, I don't think it's good for the business at all. So let's jump to 2013 then, um, when I became the employee at Koch Media. Um, they were looking for their first real social media manager. Um, before my time there, they were, they were using PR managers and they had to do the social media job additionally on their workload but they um, somehow came to the conclusion maybe, maybe this is a job for itself. Maybe we should create a headcount for this. So as you can see, this is my employer, Koch Media. Funny, funny, funny. It's really, we say it in English, Koch Media. Why? <coughs> Koch Media, well, our, co our colleagues in UK and uh, the US um, told us why we should use Koch Media. <laughs> and our CEO was asking once why, and then he accepted the explanation. So from, from the, <laughs> it's Koch Media. Um, we have been a very, very, very uh, healthy Mittelstandsunternehmen so far, but um, maybe you have read about it, maybe you don't, probably you don't. Uh, two months ago or three months ago, we were bought by a Swedish investor group, so now uh, it's big business somehow. The gamers right here, maybe you know some of the titles, Agents of Mayhem, Saints Row, Kingdom Come Deliverance, The Metro series, just to name a few, or Dead Island probably, but that's off topic in Germany. So, uh, lesson learned, first one. Um, my job has many titles. So I tried to put together some of the uh, titles my dearest colleagues had or have in their job life. Social media manager, social media editor, consultant, online editor, digital content creator, and so forth. So um, I use a color code. Uh, green, green niche are the titles that I already had in my short period of career. career. Um, at the moment, the official title is International Community Strategist. <laughs> it's so, you can, it's so German somehow. <laughs> Let's make something, hmm, this sounds great. It sounds almost English. And it bears the complexity of this modern life. International, or is it global? 
Mm, no, I think a national sounds cooler. Community, yeah. Strategist, yeah, strategist. <laughs> What's really interesting is that um, although many people are working in this field right now and it's getting bigger and bigger, um, the expectations of the employee or the guys, my coworkers, somehow they really don't fit. If you're planning to switch into this field of work, don't, then just to make sure, line perfectly out what your future employee understands <coughs> under these terms. Because from time to time it's really, it's really amazing what people think I'm doing and what I'm actually doing. Yeah, for example, my, sh my boss. <laughs> so let's see, how is the situation in Germany? Uh, that is your German social Joe Average. This is the source. Um, I also was trying to use, again, color codes. So male, yes, male-ish in a postmodern sense. Uh, white, check. Oh. Mid-30s, uh, orange, <laughs> cross the line, 39. Uh, higher education, yeah. Uh, mostly they, those people come out of the humanities and social sciences. Well, um, to be honest, it's a job thing. Um, you won't find that many engineers or machine bauer in that field of work. Job experience of three to five years, average, well, I'm a bit over that, and the income, well, yeah, 30 to 39, average wise. Mm -hmm, per yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's uh, one project done, check. Lunch, check. Another 40K. <laughs> yeah, well, don't get into this job then. <laughs> um, my Golden Handcraft, it's not a porn title, it's real. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. This is where I actually learned my community management skills on the job, doing this. Starting at filmspiegel.de, very small, very nerdy movie site, and fighting all the important questions of, what's the best Stephen King adaption? No, it's not, you fool. I own you. No, you don't. I do. You don't. I don't. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. And um, while I was working on my dissertation, I had the um, honor and privilege to work as a community manager at Süddeutsche.de, which was really great. It was, it was a huge, huge time for me, just learning so, so much in such short, short, short amount of time. Um, if, I don't know if you're from, you're, of course you're familiar with the page, but um, are you, is any of you um, active on their community site? Nope. Well, um, <laughs> no, it's not. No wonder, because they closed down their community site. So it's OK. Um, but when, we, when I was working there, um, it was really the, 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 hard, the hard trenches of World War I. Because whenever, for example, we had on a daily basis, we were dealing with, well, let's say 1,200 to 1,400 comments a day, um, depending on the topic, because if something happened in Israel or Palestina, it could go up to 3,000 a day. And most of them were really nasty ones. Um, and of course, the typical phone calls coming from the reception, oh, it's the police, it's for you again. <laughs> Hello, Rudolf here, police here. So what's the dealio? Well, user X is suing user Y for blah, 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 blah almost weekly. Well, that's the German way. <laughs> so the typical office day, just give you a minute or 30 seconds to read it because it's supposed to be funny. At least, well, in a matter of fact, it's not that far away from the truth, except for the fact that um, in presentations, this does not happen. <laughs> That's the end point. That's where the agencies come in and say, of course, this is a totally legit metric. Don't you know? 
you're such a fool. You're such a yesterday fool. Um, yeah. And somehow I feel with him because it could be me, except for the, for the hair. Um, yeah, let's have a look then. What is my typical office day look like? Okay, that's a huge monster. So, um, again, pretty German. I try to come up with one sentence combining everything. Of course, I failed. So let's split it down, shall we? Teamwork, together with my colleagues from PR and marketing. So I'm in a very privileged position at Koch Media because I'm some sort of bottleneck between PR and marketing. Um, it's tough sometimes because different interests are, are really clashing. But on the other hand, I'm learning from both sides at the same time. Um, Structure-wise, PR is, is a part of marketing at Koch Media. So my boss's boss is the director of marketing, but my sub-boss, so to speak, in a video game lingo, uh, is a senior PR. So uh, both getting the best and worst uh, of both worlds at the same time every day. But it's I think it's, it's a clever solution. On the one hand, you've got really the, the media side. On the other hand, there's the, the guys, the marketing guys with the budget to spend. Um, I, also, I also have a colleague, a uh, co-worker, uh, Marco Liebig. He's um, in, uh, working in online marketing. And he, you could say he's my counterpart because as I've mentioned, many of uh, the social media guys are straight from humanities or social science, so um, that's just like me. I don't have any clue about figures or crunching numbers, so Marco is doing that for me, booking all the ads, so I can mainly focus upon my favorite kind of thing, and that's editing or storytelling. And I'm really thankful. I could not work at a company where I have to uh, really put six from my eight hours, six hours into Excel. That's just not me, sorry. So uh, target group, okay. It may sound like marketing 101 to you now, but I'd like to mention it because gamers are a very special target group. Um, why is that? Because they are very passionate and they are very eager to spend money. And you can get them on a hype train really fast, but they are also very unforgiving. If, they tr if you try to, don't fuck up my game, attitude. Of course, we are talking about a very vocal minority, but as I said, they are really loud on social media. Um, plus, the, my experience, the last, let's say, five to six, seven years. Is any one of you familiar with the term of um, Gamergate? Yes, you are. Would you like to explain it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gamergate. It's a movement, ideologically movement. Um, they, they strongly believe that um, social justice warriors are undermining the game's media, the game's press outlets, and are also putting their leftist agendas um, into the publishing policy of video games. So they're really afraid that, uh, don't, don't, don't put your policy ideas into our video games. They're really opposed to that. So they would, of course, they would say, no, no, that's not game related at all. We're just trying to keep our hobby um, pure and playful and policy or politics. Well, this just doesn't belong in our world. I'm not here to decide upon that. I just can say you that I really despise them. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, from a professional perspective, I have to work with them. I have to find a way to deal with these questions on an everyday basis. And they are really loud and strong. And they know how to organize. 
So, well, you gotta find a way. <laughs> Editing, as I just have mentioned, this is my favorite, this is the favorite part of my job uh, because I love to tell stories and I love to find new ways or perspectives or spins on a regular product. Of course, there's always, uh, if the times are busy and stressful, there's always a way to just use the normal public relations headlines for a product and prolong them into the social world. But that's not social media for a games publisher to me. I'd like to have a unique spin and unique stories to tell. And um, this is something that most of the time happens when I'm not in the office because it's loud and it's noisy and stressful and that's okay. But um, maybe you can share this, this feeling that most of the time if you want really, really, really not creative, but really creative. So um, I'm working it from, from a home office or maybe even vacation, yeah. I think it's the, it's the best way. Sorry, <laughs> don't get into this job. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter whether I'm uh, mobile or desktop wise. It's just a matter of finding an, a unique spin for my stories, for my products to tell. Trend scouting as part of my job, I want to know as a, some sort of future teller. Um, so where will be our audience in, let's say, one year or two to three <coughs> years? Anything else is just guessing. So no one can tell you what, what will happen in about five years. I don't think this is possible at all. <coughs> On the other hand, first and second level support is a question, can I, if customers, if I have this uh, really a question of community management and I tend to spend <coughs> one or two hours a day just going in really deep in the community and, and let's see what, what is mo what's on their mind, how can I help them, are there any questions um, I can't answer because I'm not allowed to talk about them yet because it's about a feature in a game that will be revealed in the, in the near future. So that's what I understand um, when, I, when I'm talking about first and second level support. Cooperation and public speaking. Um, as, you might, as you might know, have found out by now, I'm really enjoying this public speaking. I really love it. Most of my colleagues uh, don't. <laughs> I don't know why because it's, um, I think it's very important if you call yourself a community manager well, the community is not only online, it's offline as well. So joining events and fi finding out where, where, can I, where can I meet people, where can I, it's not about, of course it's about multiplying a message product-wise. product, product wise. But at, at the end, this has nothing to do with the product. This has something to do with building up a network, a possible network, a future network. You don't know about how many people you will, know, you will meet in the future again who are, who are useful for your product. So it's simply a question of, am I willing to invest the time? Am I willing to put myself out there and try to give a talk in a different, in, or in a, in a foreign language? You're not a native speaker, but who cares? Just do it and meet, meeting interesting people. It's in the, I think it's not necessary to speak the language as an expert. Just go out there and put yourself to the test meeting interesting people, maybe something works out for your business as well. If not, I had a good time here. I had some very excellent coffee <laughs> and breakfast. If it really comes down to business, this is a question, cooperation, <laughs> it's a very classical example would be, um, let's have some sort of competition. For us in the gaming industry, this would be, I have game title XYZ. Now, who would be a good partner for, for teaming up in a social campaign. Maybe gaming hardware or eSports League. That's typical, the typical questions. Yeah, strategy and reporting. I, if you can see this, uh, boring. <laughs> but um, the guys actually who are paying my bills, they, from time to time, they're asking for this report. So I try to get to t all my figures together in one, in one nice overview, and a summary for them. So uh, before we start, bef if at, at every end of a campaign actually, or before we start a new campaign, there has to be some sort of reporting just to restarting the loop, finding new strategy, finding new angles. Um, so that's, um, 
it's really boring for me, but it has to be done. So uh, if you're really happy crunching numbers, that's so exciting, really, not. <laughs> Normally they say you should not end with a boring slide, but unfortunately, <laughs> it was the last one. And now uh, live life as if it had 28 characters, 281. You know about this? Is it too nerdy, too techy? <laughs> okay, um, yeah. Using Twitter, you only had 140 characters and they prolonged it to 280 characters. And you're such a rebel. Two, eight, one, okay. <laughs> Never mind. But thanks for your attention. And of course, I'm more than happy to answer all your questions. for you ever thought about doing your own video game? Yes, as a child. <laughs> yes, um, and I, I wrote every idea down and I had a totally great idea of how everything would work out. Unfortunately, I don't have it. I was, I guess, six or seven and I made it on a camping vacation in Italy, but uh, at the moment, no, no, no such plans. But it, um, as a matter of fact, um, working in the games industry as a social media and community manager, it's really important to have, the, to have a connection to the developers actually, because um, certain problems come up from time to time and you really have, don't have a clue what the users or players are talking about. You have to, you have to need, a, you need a, a really a fast lane if you want an answer. So if you have established already that line of communication to the developers, that's great because you pick up the phone and say, well, Jörn, what's this all about? The user is asking this and that. But if you're starting to do that the first time when the question arrives, it's too late. So that was the point I was trying to, to underline when I'm talking about networking. Networking is not only here, um, but networking is also inside your own company, of course, yeah. Are you yourself then really like a hardcore gamer or would you not <laughs> call yourself? Not anymore, to be honest. Um, I, try to, to, I try to figure out how many hours weekly I spend, I'd say half an hour a day probably when you break it down, but that's okay. Um, do you feel that it's really like necessary to, to do your job to um, be active? to really play the games? Well, I, of course I have to play, that's additionally, because you have to know about your own games you, you're publishing. Um, yes, because coming back to the community of gamers, they're really fast when it comes to, oh, this guy is such a fake, he's <laughs> phony, he's not a player at all. So why is he trying to tell us anything about our games? He's not an expert. He doesn't even have a high score. So, yes, it's also important, yeah. Did you experience that the community is still rather a niche, or is, does it get bigger and more game more diverse in your experience? It's basically everywhere. It's an old saying in German, in the Mitte der Gesellschaft angekommen. <laughs> it has arrived in the middle of society. Um, yes, it's true, because um, there are games for everyone, every, every, if you want to talk about target groups. If I say there's games for everyone and then try, there are games for boys and girls, this is, this is the wrong idea. No, it's not for boys and girls. It's about games that can both gender or whatever you call these days, fluid <laughs> entities can enjoy. So yes, they're everywhere. They're mobile, stationary. So as long as there's, I mean, the idea of playing is just hardwired into human brains. But if you're talking about digital games, well, the conditions get better and better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any desire to leave the gaming industry and do a role like this in a different industry, or has, is that something you've considered? Actually, one of the favorite questions of my mom. <laughs> <laughs> she, she asked me to, to, to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> 
last year as well because he's he did. Being there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was working as a social media manager for, um, for in in other uh, industries as well. Uh, for example, for uh, Zurich Sports, insurance companies, and BMW. Also a great time. What? Really? Yeah, a great time in in that sense that you you really learn a lot about people, how they think, and how they they have a totally different mindset. That's, it's not a cliche, it's really, insurance guys are, are, they are different. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean you can't learn anything from them. So use every chance. That's what I've learned. One of my biggest learnings, use every, every contact you make has something, yeah, has something to say to you. No. One, two. So you mentioned that you're not number one fan of uh, the Gamergate people. Um, I think you said that, yeah. Um, how do you engage uh, m communities uh, where you basically don't personally have an affinity? Difficult. Because, um, for example, when, when I'm, as a, as a private person on Twitter, I'm very strong opinionated. So, of course, this can backfire immediately. Because they will tell you, well, listen, you're this company guy, and that's, that's strange, but what's even stranger, here are your la latest 20 tweets, and you were shooting actively against our community. So how do you explain that, Mr. Company Guy? <laughs> so um, then you have to say, yeah, that's true, obviously, and let's find a way to talk about this. This is not me uh, building up walls, it's trying to more or less aggressively engage in a conversation and discussion. And if that doesn't work, well, then just try it again and again and again. And somehow, because what's the alternative? You can't just putting up walls because otherwise we believe in our own bubbles. That's great for a time. Of course, I'm enjoying this as well. Well, that's my opinion and that's my opinion, great. But what happens outside of the bubble, so. You mentioned the, the, to the fight and, and the community yes. push being shut down. Is that where you see this going? <laughs> um, where just people speaking loudly at each other? Um, honestly, good? no, because one of the main reasons for, for, for companies to have these comment sections is a way to, uh, if you're engaging in a, com a community, they, they're really glad because you will see the ads longer. It's really simple as that from time to time. On the other hand, no, I think we're, we live in a very, there's, there's no shortage of engagement from both sides. But the problem is they don't talk to each other. They basically talk to themselves a lot. You know. Yes? like to build up a bit on the previous question about yeah. your uh, about what your mom is actually saying. <laughs> so, uh, about my mom. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it will not get first. <laughs> so, um, um, you have shown in the presentation, or you tell us a story about the past, about the childhood, and then about the freelance thing, and then actually uh, getting co in the, into the corporate world. And I had the feeling that you are living your life um, at least if you had like 70 characters. For now, I don't mean your private life. I mean your corporate life, obviously. So, what your plans actually are for the future? How do you want to achieve that 281 character in your life? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good question, and my answer to that: I reduced my uh, work time at Koch Media to uh, 32 and a half hours weekly. So, uh, so I can be uh, the fifth day on Friday. Well, it's Friday. Yeah. Why am I being here? Go out there. <laughs> no, um, I'm teaching at university, um, and it's really fulfilling. Really, it's so inspiring, and it gives me this deep f feeling of satis sa satis uh, satisfaction. Yeah, mm -hmm. satisfaction. Um, but unfortunately, you can't do this when you're planning paying your bills. It doesn't work out. So four days at Koch, 
that's okay. It's not that I hate it there. It's okay. I for example, my colleagues and coworkers are really enjoying working with them. But uh, from time to time, you just need that extra, that extra thing spinning your head, getting new ideas, getting out of this product, product, product thinking. So I found that's a good opportunity. I just reduced my work time, four days at Koch, one day at university, makes a great mixture. It's okay for me. I s yeah, I guess that's the, that's the famous, I have to find a compromise somewhere, formula. And I, of course, yeah, if you're planning to do this, go for it. Reduce your time. Just check, go figures, take a look at the numbers, rent, food, water, is it okay? Electricity, fine, go there. Just one day per week. It's really great. What are you teaching about? Oh yeah, um, at the moment it's um, creative writing in regards to uh, video and computer games. Because um, I've made the exp uh, uh, lots of people inside the humanities, they like to they like to write about video games, but what they actually do is they're, they're heavily focused on the product. They're trying to read the product in a critical spin. They try to find angles like um, take a look at the game and then find, find their way of talking about it. But I try to teach them that the whole industry has more to offer to write about. If you think about the, the materials Nintendo or Sony or Microsoft is using to put together their hardware. Where does it come from? From Africa and the coal mines. These are typical topics, but you don't know about them if you don't have someone to pinpoint it to. So I try to give them some ideas what they can also write about. Writing about video games does not mean writing about video games. That's, that's the last course I taught, yeah. Uh, one, two. So two of my friends and myself, we are in the process of integrating gambling into online games. <laughs> so let's say we are both of us. <laughs> 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 so we're just talking about it, thinking about it. So the idea is that two people who are, for example, playing online uh, FIFA against each other can now play for money. <laughs> <laughs> How far along are you? Yeah. This is the host, gentlemen. <laughs> so, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, is there a fourth place? <laughs> well, it definitely has a future. You can see that it's uh, gambling. It's huge. It's always been huge, but I think we're entering a new dimension. So, um, it's two big addictions that are being combined. <laughs> Combining the mega addiction. <clears throat> it's okay. I wouldn't play because I'm just uh, FIFA is not my game, so I wouldn't dare to play for money. But um, I'm pretty sure this this should work out. Did I say that? But maybe you should use our games, not FIFA. <laughs> the third question would be so engaged. Um, <laughs> could you please share some insights about where the uh, games industry is going uh, regarding the platforms, for example? Uh, I was a, like a hardcore gamer myself, I suppose, played like MMOs and strategies at the time. Yeah. And now they like kind of disappeared, I suppose. So MOBAs and stuff are like in maybe this new battle royale stuff. Yeah. And does it actually go to mobile, or <coughs> do we have like a big? Um, Membership will also play on PC, maybe tablet. What's what's the future platform of gaming will be in like two, three, four years maybe from now? Wow, if I knew, <laughs> I would totally quit my job. And no, uh, I don't know. We were also pretty. If you think back about the the enormous surprise um, coming with Nintendo Switch, suddenly. We were really impressed by the numbers, and we were also impressed by the decline of the Xbox, for example. And the ratio from PlayStation to Xbox now, uh, product-wise, is 8, sometimes 12 to 1. If you compare that to last generation, that's enormous. That's really enormous. So I wouldn't dare to predict that kind of question. So um, I really think gaming will be even more 
ubiquitous, that's the word? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, if you take back to coming back to Nintendo Switch, it would, maybe it's just one device you can use for almost everything. Playing on the go, playing at home, maybe with a, some little tweak, basically turning it into a VR machine. But I couldn't tell otherwise, no. It's just too, there's so, so, so much happening at the same time with a strong indie sector now, giving us ideas, 24-7 new ideas to play out. Are focusing on mobile? Yes. Mainly. Yeah. That was my question. Oh, okay. So is mobile the platform now? <coughs> it is and it has been for some time and it's growing. Yes. Yeah. And it's also growing maybe for for the, for the typical genres you think about now are related somehow to still desktop gaming. gaming. That's what I think, yeah. Yes? I don't know why, but I just thought about Pokemon Go. Uh, Pokemon Go? Oh, yes, yeah. Um, is it dead, or why do you think it's dead? Um, because it was only a short time. It was, a a, I think, a big hype, and then it yeah. died. No, it's not, it's not it's dead. It's not dead, but... Uh, but it has, it, has found its, it has found its niche. Yeah. But within, yeah, okay. within that niche, it's still very successful and um, beloved by the players. Okay. Yeah. What's up, Sir Victor? To that question, I think it was such a boom like one and a half years ago or so, because it was the first game that actually yeah. brought AR to, to mobile. Mm -hmm. So that's why everyone wanted to try it. And to the other question of the gentleman in front, I think, um, yes, mobile will be stronger. That's just my two cents, okay. Um, I think mobile will be stronger, but um, the consoles and the computers won't die. Like, I think publishers will try to bring as many games as they can to the mobile devices as well. But where I think is the industry going is really the, um, the immersion, you know, like to develop more games that really bring the player into the game. Um, you can see it in small steps with the uh, Nintendo Labo that's going to come out soon, where you actually put yourself, your devices together out of cardboard, <laughs> but have a really uh, immersive um, experience. Um, and I think VR is going to be stronger, AR is going to be stronger. They'll eventually develop a system that you can actually have at home that works well <laughs> and doesn't make you sick. I think that's where we're going. But um, I think I don't think that it's gonna be like mobile on top of everything. I think it's an addition, but very strong market as well. Thanks for much. Any more questions or comments? Yes, please. I would like to know how influences the YouTubers have in the gaming community here, or because it seems to be very important that lots of people. Yeah. get information from the YouTubers and trust them and so on, so I was just wondering what's yeah. their influence part. Um, if you want to be very, very pessimistic, um, you can conclude that actually the, the, the buyer of video games nowadays has only two metrics when it comes to their buying decision. The one is Amazon ratings, one to five stars, and you're really fucked if your product comes out and the first tens are one stars. Really fucked. And the other one are indeed those influencers, those Let's Players. And in a matter of fact, Let's Players or influencers, they take up um, almost 40% of my time at Koch Media because I'm their first point of reference for their questions, sending out review copies to them, getting their stores, collecting all their comments, their feedback, that's my job. So yeah, it's really huge and it's getting bigger. And of course these, this market, and I'm talking really talk about market, they are professionalizing at a high speed now. Um, if you want to get into touch with the greater ones, talking about numbers, viewers, um, you won't get in touch with them. They have managers now. And this is nothing unusual. So, yeah, that's the answer. Short, yes. Huge, getting bigger, yeah. <coughs> of course, we will see how, because when YouTube is pulling the plug, there goes your business. If Twitch is pulling the plug, 
There goes your business. It's very problematic for them. Well, I'm afraid <laughs> that's, that's all the interest I got from you. Well, any more? Because otherwise... Okay, thank you very much.